Hello. We're back with another installment from Bare Bones Bio, but this time it'll be on pain. Now, pain is a pretty big topic, so I'll be doing it in two parts. But the first part will just be really general, just an introduction to pain with some very key mechanisms that you should know. So first, we'll go over the overview of the pain pathway from a stimuli into a perception in the brain. Then we'll be going over two key pain neurotransmitters and their balance, which is glutamate and GABA. Um, then we'll be going over some glutamate and trp one receptors and how you can actually modulate these receptors using various different compounds. And then we'll be touching on chronic pain and long-term potentiation and depression. It's a very interesting topic, which I don't feel like we learned enough about in class. And then we'll finally touch on experimental methods, which should be very useful in the future should you want to test your pain. Okay. Okay. So let's look at where pain really starts. Now, this system is probably still very brief in comparison to what actually takes place in your body. But it all begins with some noxious stimuli. Now, this can really vary from whether it's a mechanical stimuli, like, like getting poked or with something, or if it's heat or if it's an acid and protons are present. But all this does is that triggers some sort of chemical, or others say don't like heat, stimulates some receptors directly, but some agonist acts on the receptor, and these receptors are called nociceptors. And this causes action potentials in your primary afferent neurons. Uh, these neurons are special. They have a free nerve ending, like this, which means they don't have another synapse to another neuron. They have the receptors all over the end. And these nociceptors are found throughout, whether it's at the free nerve ending, whether it's on the axon or on the cell body. Now, something special to note is that you need a specific integration of these signals for the cell, for the neuron to actually fire. So if you have just one being activated, it's likely not going to fire. But if you have a bunch of different ones being activated altogether, a bunch of different nociceptors, then you can get the action potential being sent. Now, there's multiple different fibers that bring it down. There are C fibers, which are unmyelinated, so they might cause like, slow throbbing pain, some hypothesize. Or you might have A delta fibers, which are myelinated, and it just allows a faster conduction, so maybe a sharp pain. It then enters from the periphery into the central nervous system, and it travels through the dorsal horn, which is the back end of the vertebra, um, into your spinal cord. Okay? This is where incoming signals come in. And then it travels up the spinal cord and where it reaches a gate. Now, this is a structure that's still not fully understood. It's a theory. But the gate basically recognizes the pattern and frequency. And then it decides whether it's important enough to send up to the brain or if it should be, or if it should be sent back down or dissipated or whatnot. So the gate decides what signals are sent up. And then it travels up to the brain where it first reaches the, the medulla. And this, can, this is related to the autonomic nervous system, where it can affect heart rate, breathing, breathing rate, pupil dilation, and just affect sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system. Um, then you also have the thalamus snacks, which is this, a bit of relay processing. And finally, somatosensory cortex. Uh, it probably just a bunch of different spots too, but these are just some broad categories. But in the somatosensory cortex, in the homunculus, it basically localizes the pain to a specific area of the body and determines where it came from. So for example, here, it would know that it came from the hand. Okay, so we'll be going over some neurotransmitters. Now, these two neurotransmitters work on a balance in your pain system. And I drew a balance here to show that, but glutamate is your main excitatory neurotransmitter actually. And then GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And they work in a balance to send signals throughout your body now, glutamate is made from glutamine, which is an amino acid, and it's conditionally essential, meaning that it's mostly produced de novo in your body, but during times of stress, you might need more. So you also might need to get it from your diet. How glutamate works is that it actually opens sodium channels or other cation channels on your postsynaptic neuron, which depolarizes that neuron and causes the action potential to fire. Now, if you have too low glutamate, you could get limbic structure issues like issues with learning, memory, and focus. Because glutamate is essentially a hippocampus for strengthening synapses in response to memory. But if it's too high, you can also get seizures or neuron damage, uh, which is excitotoxicity, which I will go, which I will explain more about in a future video.
but it basically causes too much excitement. On the other hand, GABA is actually um, produced from glutamate through glutamate decarboxylase um, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. What that does is that it opens anion channels, like chlorine channels, on the postsynaptic neuron, which hyperpolarizes it. And if you have too low, you could get conditions like depression, anxiety, or sleeping disorders. And this is essentially because GABA, in, in a sense, calms down the brain. So if you're missing that GABA, your brain will be overactive during some, during some processes. Um, an interesting fact, though, is that the metabolites can actually form anticonvulsants for GABA. Okay, so we'll be looking at glutamate a bit more closely and looking at some of its receptors. And there's two broad classes, really. There is your ionotropic receptors, which are ion channels. And then you have your metabotropic receptors, which are GPCRs. Now, metabotropic receptors, there's really only one of them we look at, which is emoglur. And then for ion channels, there's kinase channels, AMPA receptors. And then NMDA is the one we look at more, most closely, the NMDA receptor. Now, NMDA receptors are an ion channel, so they allow mostly cation transfer, which is sodium and a lot of calcium to enter, and then potassium is the one that leaves. They all have four subunits. So they all have two N1 subunits, which binds glycine or deserin as one of its sites. You need at least one for the channel to actually open. It's mostly deserin, which is a D isomer of serin, but glycine is the one we talked most about. Then for the N2 subunits, um, it really varies which one it is. And, it and they all have different alsteric sites and different modulation sites. But the N2A, for example, or both all of them have glutamate sp binding spots. They all bind glutamate. Just remember, it's a glutamate ion channel. But you can also bind NMDA, which is actually what it's named after. For the N2A, it has an allosteric site for zinc, which is an allosteric modulator. It negatively um, inhibits the channel from opening. And magnesium does the same. It blocks it. And ketamine, a compound you might be familiar with, actually blocks it as well. But what's, what you should really take away from this is that to open, you need three things. You need glutamate or an NMDA. You need glycine or deserin. And then you also need a specific membrane potential. And you might be wondering why. Well, that membrane potential actually dislodges certain um, metallic ions, such as zinc or magnesium. And that's actually what allows the channel to open and for these cations to flow through. With conditions like chronic pain and also with memory and learning, a process takes place called long-term potentiation, which basically means that your synapses get strengthened. So just looking at this, you can see there's more receptors on there, on the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. There is higher intercellular concentration of calcium and sodium, indicating that these channels are more active. And what this does is causes higher frequency of signaling, which leads to more pain perception, for example, in these types of neurons with glutamate receptors. Now, how that's facilitated by, we didn't really talk about, so feel free to skip this. But this really helped uh, solidify my understanding at least of LTP. So you have these receptors called AMPA receptors, which we did talk about above, but they're also an ion channel. And what they do is they also bind glutamate, right? And in the receptors, like I said, they can't work unless you add a specific membrane potential. And how that's facilitated is through these AMPA receptors. So AMPA receptors bind glutamate when the cell is not fully depolarized. And then the AMPA receptors are then able to depolarize the membrane to a certain extent that it allows the magnesium and zinc ions to kind of come off the NMDA receptors. And then what that allows is for the NMDA receptors to open and for calcium to flow through. That calcium, if this is done with brief, intense stimulation, that calcium will then activate certain enzymes, kinases, and it's a complex mechanism, but it allows AMPA receptors to actually be more upregulated on the cell membrane. And over time, after periods of brief intense stimulation, you get much more AMPA receptors that are present on the postsynaptic neuron, and that allows a more potential response. You have more glutamate that's able to be received by the neuron, 
you get more firing of the neuron and you have less magnesium and zinc concentrations to kind of modulate that NMDA receptor. And this is a process more similar to learning or memory. You just keep firing a neuron, it keeps learning and increasing concentration of specific receptors, and then it recognizes that pattern. It's fully potentiated to a specific pattern and it's input sensitive. Okay. In a similar mechanism, you also have long-term depression, which instead of brief, intense stimulation, you have you have frequent, very low intensity stimulation over and over and over and over again. And what that does is that the amper receptor is actually down-regulated on the cell membrane. It's similar. Instead of having more AMPA, though, you have less AMPA on the membrane. I haven't drawn it here. But how that works is that you have such little calcium intake because the NMDA receptors are mostly blocked by magnesium and zinc, but small amounts of calcium actually follows a, follows a transduction pathway that leads to desensitization of the AMPA receptors, or um, downregulation of them at least. And that leads to the opposite, which is less likely to respond to stimuli. And you can think of them in really general terms, though. Long-term potentiation means strength in synapses, more likely to respond or stronger responses. And long-term depression is when it's less likely to respond to glutamate, and, there's, and the neural responses are not as frequent or not as strong. Okay. Also, um, long-term potentiation could also increase the amount of glutamate being released from the presynaptic neuron, and long-term depression can also decrease the amount of glutamate from the presynaptic neuron. These are all mechanisms involved, and LTP is a very complex process, okay? Okay, we'll also be looking at TRPE1 receptor, another nociceptor in your body. It's not found in birds, which is interesting, and I'll say an application for that later on, which was mentioned in class, but your TRPE1 receptors are basically, they may look like a GPCR, but they're a vanilloid receptor. So it acts similar to that, but it has six, trans six transmembrane loops. Um, it responds to a variety of different things. So acidity, like protons, is one. Um, anandamide, which you're familiar with. Um, but mostly heat or drugs that are similar to producing that effect, like capsaicin. So what that means is that when you think of heat, think of inflammation. When you have inflammation, you're, it's often accompanied by heat. And that's actually what's triggering these. And the, that's what links it to the pain system. But you also have drugs like capsaicin, which is found in hot peppers. And that's also an agonist to these receptors. You also have some other things that I mentioned, which is mustard and wasabi that contain a compound called allyl isothiocyanate. I'm not even going to try to say that ever again. But, it's, but these also have a similar response. And lastly, you have acetaminophen which is an active com compound in Tylenol. And you might be wondering, wait, a drug that we take for reducing pain actually activates a pain receptor? How does that work? Right? Well, it's actually because trippy one receptors are easily desensitized. So when you have too much of these agonists, um, the receptor quickly desensitizes itself to um, these chemicals or its activation. And this causes relief for a certain period of time. And these drugs take advantage of that mechanism to cause pain relief. Now, its response when it's activated is that it releases a lot of chemicals that are involved in the pain system. Substance P, CGRP, but most notably glutamate, which is the one that we talked about. So that's kind of how it all comes full circle. And you have these chemicals, a lot of a variety of agonists causing pain throughout its chemical um, release. Now, something else to mention is that acetaminophen inhibits anandamide reuptake. And that's good because when you have anandamide that's left in the synapse, it can continuously um, agonize that CB1 receptor and that allows it to inhibit glutamate release into the synapse. If glutamate's not being released, you're not feeling pain. So acetaminophen has kind of two really good effects for reducing pain. Okay, so we're just going to be quickly going over some experimental techniques. Um, the first one that we talked a lot about 
is this von Frey esthesiometer. But it's probably really expensive. It can be substituted for something much cheaper like fishing line, which is monofilament. And that shares the same special property, which is that at a specific tension, it provides a maximal force. And what that does is it allows each monofilament piece, depending on how thick it is, to be specifically calibrated to a specific amount of force. And that's useful in an experimental setting. So when you're measuring a pain modulated reflex response, you want to know when the mice felt pain. And that's why these, de these devices are so useful. So you have a mice in this wire grid and your, your anesthesiometer can just poke through one of these holes and like hit the mice's foot. You don't want to hit its nose or anything and you want to do it as gently as possible because you just want it to tickle them. If it hurts them, if, you, if they feel pain, their threshold changes. You only want to test their threshold. And this is a good way to test whether the mice is in pain or not. Because generally, mice that are more in pain are going to respond to less force being placed on a certain body part of them. So that's the mechanism that works on. And there's also the thermal stimulus tail foot test, which is basically when the mice's tail is on this hot, hot plate device. It's like a hot plate. Probably didn't do it justice. But then basically, when it starts heating up, at a certain temperature, the mice feels enough pain to flick its tail up. And that tells you its pain threshold. Now, a mice with thermal hyperalgesia, which is more susceptible to thermal pain, will likely shoot its tail up at a lower temperature. So that's how these really work. But like, I don't know if I already mentioned this, but it's not useful for bone pain. It's only useful for demonstrating hyperalgesia in the tail region, but not related to the bone. Okay, that's all I have. But if you have any questions, reach out to me. Um, if you need any diagrams or extra notes or anything like that, just let me know.